somebody else to kind of work uh, like sisters in the wilderness. And because this is part of the eighth principal project, you know, we, we're going to provide some background. So tonight, a lot of what we're going to talk about is background. There's, there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, number one, I know from my experience, even teaching in a university setting that expecting students to have done a lot of reading before the first class is a really fun dream, but you know, it doesn't always happen the way that the most even optimistic people like myself hope. Um, and so I, I, I just preferred to have tonight be more about setting this um, you know, tone and getting us on the same page. Some of you who are in slavery by another name will have heard some of this before, but, but most of this is, is new and particular to this class. Um, I should say from the top, um, just because of the nature of all of our lives, uh, we will be recording these and making these available um, uh, in, a, in a way on the UUCM YouTube page. So if uh, for some reason you do not want to be on uh, video, then make sure you let us know. Then we won't call on you because yes, I will call on people. Um, and, um, and if your video isn't on, you actually don't show up on the recording we've found. It, it won't even be a little blank thing with your name like you see now. I don't understand how it all works, but that's what happens in the end. All right. Um, so this, this class is, uh, as you may or may not know, is about the, 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 the Dolores Williams text, Sisters in the Wilderness, The Challenge of Womanist God Talk. And we will speak as to what all that stuff means, at least to us, um, uh, in the short term. Um, this class was, uh, it was sort of my big idea, but, um, but I have been thinking about this since last spring, um, and in fact, invited intern Ali and Dion Ford and of Shirley Williams to be a part of planning this to make sure we were doing this well and thoroughly and with accountability and having some fun along the way. Um, and so uh, Shirley has not been able to continue. Um, she had some conflicts she was not able to uh, resolve, uh, but she certainly had a lot to do with us thinking about what this class could be and how we should prepare it, right? Um, so. Um, and I will be sharing all the notes that I teach from with all of you after every class. I will send out a link with any materials I refer to, as well as my teaching notes and a link to the recording to all who register after every class. I usually get it on Thursday around noon. It takes a little while for the video to get processed on the YouTube page. All right. So all of that is as it may be. So... Um, first thing I want to do is I want to introduce the team or let them introduce themselves. Um, I do not, like I said, I, I, Ali is not able to be with us tonight. I believe uh, uh, Z may join us later, but, uh, but Ali will be with us the rest of this journey. Um, so uh, so uh, you know who I am, Reverend Scott Sandler Michael, senior co-minister. Um, and uh, I uh, have had the, the, the privilege of being co-minister here with my wife, Anya, since August of 2017. And uh, I uh, studied theology at Meadville Lombard Seminary and other places. Uh, Meadville is where I got my degree. That's where I met my partner in life and ministry, Anya. Um, and Anya's actually on their board these days. She's, on, she's co president of the Meadville Seminary Board. Um, it, Meadville was founded in the early 20th century um, to be a contributor to the leading thought of theology of its age in the early 20th century to the University of Chicago Consortium of Theological Schools. <clears throat> and and in, in so being, it uh, 
is continuing to try and remain on the cutting edge of the conversation about what is theology and how do we do it in ways that have meaning for our lives. Um, um, my other teaching experience comes from some university experience I had, um, whether they were community colleges in uh, the outskirts of Baltimore uh, or my primary uh, service in the academy, which was for Coppin University, historically back college in Baltimore's Northwest side. I taught there for about 12 years. Um, so that's me. Um, and uh, please, Dion, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dion Ford, a member of this beautiful congregation uh, since Oh my goodness, I guess 2003 or 2004. And I was so thrilled when Reverend Scott invited me to participate in this wonderful exploration of Sisters in the Wilderness. Um, uh, I came, before I was a UU, I grew up in the AME church. My father's an AME minister. And um, actually before I ever heard of this text, I heard about, um, um, womanist uh, thought in theology through Alice Walker, a favorite, a favorite writer. So it's very uh, beautiful for me and, and a nice full circle to uh, now consider where that idea sprung from and all that it's um, kind of planted and helped to grow. So I'm really looking forward to learning <laughs> and helping um, and just talking about what I've learned in this. And I guess Reverend Scott reminded me that I actually have taught before. I, I forgot. I <laughs> taught creative writing at NYU for a semester. So um, hopefully that'll kick back in and, and I'll be able to help facilitate this beautiful conversation we're going to have. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you being a part of this. One of the things that I realized um, early on was that how important it would be for us to, to try and equip the members of our congregation to do what Dolores Williams has done. And, and, and that being how to tell our stories about our development, but specifically our theological development through our own particularity. And we'll be talking about that a lot more. And that is something that Dion has a lot of experience in. She's a writer and, um, and I had the, the, the great privilege of reading some chapters from a book that she's working on um, uh, recently and, and she really models that. So we're really blessed to have that. I, I should also share that one of my projects, one of my hopes for a congregation of our size is that we are a place that we can do this kind of difficult in-depth uh, learning that, you know, I, I, I call it the mini seminary, um, you know, and this really is, is, is something that may sadly seem unusual in some Unitarian Universalist circles, but most, most religious institutions think it's their duty to teach folks how to read and understand and adopt sacred scripture and other writings that speak to the spirit and how we develop those ideas and concepts and practices that enrich our spirit. So that's what this is a part of. I also wanna reach out to uh, Deborah Ann Tripoldi, who's going to be our tech for most of these classes, if not all of them, if I'm lucky. Deb, say hi to folks so they know who you are. Hi, I'm Deborah Ann. As I said, as Reverend Scott said, I'm teching this. Um, I've been a member of UCM since 2017, right? Not surely after Reverend Scott and Ravanya got there. Uh, with a little nudge of Foxy, share poem, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm on the communications team and I do various um, different projects with uh, UCM. Awesome, thank you so much. So, you know, first it's, it's important for us to give a chance to say hello to one another and to, to let folks in the room see our faces and hear our voices for those who want to share. So, um, I'm gonna ask us to be brief because there's a lot of material that I hope to cover tonight. For those of you who have my classes before, you might know what you're in for. Um, 
Um, so, uh, so this is a brief go around and I want you to respond to just these simple questions. Share your name, whether you're a member of UU Montclair or not, and, and briefly one hope for the class. And I'll, I'll model, I'm Reverend Scott Samler Michael. I'm, I'm one of the co-ministers. And one of my hopes is that we equip each other to tell our theological stories. Um, and I'll call on folks to make this go quicker. All right. Um, all right, I'm gonna call on Susan Kirchmar next. Hello everyone, my name is Susan. I am a member of congregation and I hope to learn more about uh, theology of uh, African-American women and to get to know you a little bit better on more personal basis, uh, deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea. All right. Andrea. Andrea. Am I unmuted? Yes. Hi, greetings. Um, <clears throat> I am a member of the Montclair UU Church, a recent transplant from Wisconsin, Racine, Wisconsin UU Church. And um, my journey, I think, began seriously with the Cakes for the Queen of Heaven curriculum at uh, the UU Church, and I have been on a path of women's spirituality since, so I'm looking, really looking forward to this class. Thank you. Um, I'm going in alphabetical order by first name, so if you want to guess where I'm going next, Annalise. Hi, <clears throat> Annalise, uh, she, her, hers, a member of UUCM. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing all of your stories. Awesome. Dana Moore. Hi, I'm Dana Moore. I am celebrating one year of membership at the UUCM. Um, and my hope is that uh, you all feel as loved and held as I have in this past year in being with you. I hope we feel that together in this class. Awesome. Debbie Ann. Um, yes, yeah, this is a member here and um, hope to learn more. Awesome. Dr. Mary Jones. Uh, hi, yeah, uh, Mary Jones. Um, I'm a member for a very, very short time. Uh, I'm hoping to see the commonality all of us have as women with theology. Thank you. Eileen. Hi, everyone. I'm Eileen. I'm a member. And um, I'm just hoping to learn more. I haven't been thinking, honestly, in a theological sense in a long time. So I'm just hoping to, to learn. Great. Ellie Bagley. Hi, I am UU adjacent, <laughs> ever closer to becoming a member. Um, and I've taken, I don't know, a lot of Scott's classes and I find it really interesting. So I, and I've never really looked at theology. I started the book and I was like, whoa, there's all this Bible stuff. So uh, <laughs> I think it's really interesting to see uh, a matriarchal twist on all of this. So I'm excited to learn more. Awesome, thank you. Foxy. Maybe I'll come back to you, Cher. All right. Who were you calling on? I was calling on Foxy, Cher Pullen. But go ahead, Judy, you're next. What about Deborah Corbett? Did she talk? <laughs> oh, I went right past Deborah. Thank you for. Ah. Thank you, Judy. I was just going to wait till the end and ask about that. <laughs> Thanks for teaching me the alphabet. See, you, you got to teach too. 
<laughs> anyway, thank you. I'm uh, Deborah Corbett, a longtime member here. And really, I've just had such a positive experience signing up for things that I saw this said, I don't know anything about this. And then I saw who was involved and when I'd like to learn from them. And so I come rather empty, but interested to all of this. Mm, cool, thank you. All right. And now? And, and next we have uh, Jane. Hi. I'm Jane Gertner, and I thought I had unmuted myself. Um, I'm a longtime member of UUCM and also a Cakes for the Queen of Heaven graduate 27, 28 years ago, and um, just a very big, um, um, my, my higher power is a feminine divine. So I'm just interested in expanding my understanding and knowledge of the feminine divine. Awesome. Judy. And hi, I'm Judy Rainierson. I'm a, also a longtime member, about 20 years. Uh, and I also uh, got immediately attracted to this by the Cakes for the Queen of Heaven, which is uh, a course that I've taught twice now. And, uh, and I definitely need to learn a lot more about this. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Karen. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I'm Karen Bonaswalski. I'm not a member of the church of Montclair, but I'm a frequent flyer. And um, I'm interested in this because I want to know what is this woman, womanist God talk? And I, and I want to hear and listen to uh, different voices and perspectives that I I'm, I'm haven't been exposed to uh, before. Awesome, thanks. Maria. Hi, um, I'm Maria Scott. I was uh, raised in the UU Church. I'm a member of the Olympia Brown Unitarian Universalist Church in Racine, Wisconsin. And um, I also did cakes 25 so years ago. And I'm hoping to touch that place in myself again that I discovered there uh, in cakes. Thank you, thank you. Mary Moriarty. Hello, everyone. I am a longtime member. And I, I think there, were three, there were three questions, but I only remember two. Oh, one my hope. name and if I was a member. One hope. And what? One hope for the class. Yeah. A hope um, that I can stop getting giddy at hearing the term womanist theology because I was raised in the Catholic Church. So I. <laughs> it, it, it makes me laugh every time I hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Nicole Gray. Um, Nicole Gray, and I'm a member. Um, this is part of the eighth principle journey that I'm on. And um, I don't have as much experience with womenist theology, I think, as most people here. But I have taken all of Rev Scott's classes and obviously this resonates with me and I really like the cover of the book I just think it's like like this when I got this book I was so happy so my goal is to read as much much of this book as I can with you guys yay and you are a member indeed Nicole are you not yes Peg Sipe hi I'm Peg sometimes known also as Margaret um I've been a member since my kids were about seven or eight maybe and they're 22 so what is that 15 years or so uh of the uu congregation at montclair and um i've been reading cast by isabel wilkerson and finding it an absolutely life-changing book so got interested in this through that i'm a feminist and i'm interested in anti-racist work and I also teach um, Heating the Call, our eighth grade curriculum on social change. And um, we spent a, a fair amount of time this fall talking about the eighth principle. So I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing more. Awesome. Susie. Hi, um, thanks for having me. I'm Susie, she, her, my pronouns. Um, 
I am interested in this class because um, I've always went, well, I've always gone against um, the submissive um, uh, expectations of my culture. And um, even in, I was raised Catholic. So when I was younger at like 12 or 13, I flat out told my grandmother, I am not confirming um, in this church. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't have a choice of being baptized, but I'm making a choice of not affirming um, to this um, ideology of, you know, God is, is a man. So I think I really want to be tested by this text um, because I feel deep down in my heart that I am a feminist, but are my actions um, and my thoughts, are they also aligned with that? And this is something that I would want to pass, pass on to my daughter as well. I think she's more of a feminist than I am. So. Sue Ralfer, I believe I skipped over you. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. Um, uh, Sue Raffer, she, her, hers, member uh, for about 13 years. Um, I was hoping that I could join, have, take this class with my sister because she is uh, Roman Catholic as I was raised and um, is a feminist, uh, has studied uh, feminist theology and has dragged me to some of her classes. and. And I thought, I'm gonna drag you to one of my classes where I'm gonna talk about womenist God talk. And I don't know what the difference is. So that's, I'm all about learning it. Wow, awesome. I wish you luck in getting your sister to come. And Wendy McNeil. Hey, I'm Wendy McNeil. And I, I was a member back in the eighties. I was married at UU and my son was dedicated and he's 29. And then I went away for a little bit and now I'm back. So, um, and when I was about 19, I took a class when I was an undergraduate at NYU on women in theology. And I think it's time for me to like spruce it up a bit. And I love reading the Bible. So I'm happy to be here, thank you. Awesome. Is there anyone I missed? Just me. Oh, hey, Foxy. I'm Reverend Foxy, otherwise known as Cher Pullen. I'm a Druid. Um, I was affiliated with UU Fort Lauderdale for six years before I moved to Ohio. I probably am the spiritual grandmother of Sacred Wheel. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to exposing myself to the experiences of other women of color who are theologians. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, look at that. We've got quite a room. Uh, we have 26 folks signed up for this class. We currently have 22 screens. I say screens because I never know how many people are actually looking at any individual screen or listening from around the corner. Um, so that's a good class, and uh, and you guys uh, are are in for uh, for a treat here. We will have plenty of time in this class. Well, I will break you out into smaller groups for more discussion. Um, those of you who have taken the slavery class and the widening the circle class, you know we do a lot of presentation because there's a lot of material to share, um, but we're going to leave open a lot of time you know, for, you know, one-on-one -on -one encounter and some other activities. Um, so I just want you to bear with us. Because I, so let me just get started and you'll see as I present. So, so, so first, what's this class going to be like? Um, so, you know, this class is going to be one where we really try and encourage and hold one another accountable for doing the best we can to prepare the readings each week. You know, uh, I completely understand if it seems like there's a whole lot of um, unusual ways of saying things and talking about things in, in, in a text like this, which is why we're doing some setup tonight on what is theological thinking, what is theological writing, 
um, what what different types of theologies are there, um, and you know, and and how is this text situated in the history of theology? All of those things, you know, the team thought was necessary to get us to that point before we really dig into the text itself. All right, I shared in the chat um, some of these notions about how we run the class. Um, but this will be in the notes that I share, I send out with you later. So you don't have to worry about copying and pasting anything I put in the chat. Anything I put in the chat is something I will send to you later. So I just want you to be able to, you know, focus and pay attention to what we're doing. Um, each week, I always encourage folks to come to the class with a, with a question that emerges from the text. You know, we can talk about anything for an hour and a half but we've chosen to talk about the text. So that if there's one way that I'm kind of a stickler, I want us to stay focused on the text. Um, and I think it's a fruitful way to go. Um, um, so uh, if there's a section in the text that we, that we do not cover, but you think is important, please, you know, um, you know raise your hand and, and encourage us to spend some time on it. Lead us through your concern, question, or observation um, in the text. Um, um, I'm going to put out a note about this when I send out the, the uh, email tomorrow. Um, if you are someone who prefers to walk through a class like this in teams, uh, I will encourage you to self-organize to do that. Um, if you want my help doing that, let me know. Um, you know, some folks' lives are just too busy to add another meeting about a class where it's already something I have to read a lot for, but you may, you may just prefer that style of learning. That might work better for you and only you know that. Um, I From the start, I, I realized that when we first set the class up, we said five weeks. I think we want to do six and, and seeing that it's already 7.30, I think I know why. Um, um, uh, but that last week, uh, we we're going to be encouraging those who are so inclined to do some writing and reflecting of their own. And that sixth week, we're going to continue talking about how do we equip you to tell your story of, of your development, of your value formation, of what happened to you that only happened to you, that can only liberate the story of what is important, what you find to be of ultimate concern, um, and how to share that. Um, and so, so that's sort of the product of the class in our eyes in some ways, that we get to a point that we've given you those tools. Um, and, you know, so, but, but first we're gonna do this journey of what is the theology, what is theological learning? And, um, and so, so we will we're, we'll add a class on the end of this. I believe that this class was scheduled to end on March 25th. Instead, it's gonna end on I'm just doing the math in my head because I know the Sunday is April 1st. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, so uh, let us get started first with just what is theology? What is theology? All right. Um, so I'm just going to invite you to, to write these into your, into your chat as I start to, to, uh, to share. So um, and we can talk about them later, but um, I, a couple of prompts. So just off the top of your head, what is theology? What does, was, does God or goddess look like to you? So I encourage you, uh, if you have a response to that, to put it in the chat. The chat is also something we will save each week, so we will have record of this as well. All right, so Think about that as I start winding us up to talk about what is theology overall. So so one of the things that I think is really important to know and for, for, for you to understand is that theology is basically simply seeking seriously the answers to the deep questions of our existence. So theology deals with what I like to call, theology is a composite science. What does that mean? Well, I'm gonna share something in the screen 
on the screen with you. And I will share this document with you later so you don't have to scribble things down unless that's how you learn and participate. Um, so anytime someone says, why is there something instead of nothing? Anytime someone says, why do bad things happen to good people? Anytime someone says, you know, why is the world made like this? Anytime someone wonders what happens when we die or what does it mean to really thrive and live or what am I supposed to do in this world? We're asking theological questions. And, and here in the early 21st century, we, we, it, we live in a time after that basic human impulse that begins when we're, as soon as we're able to talk or actually before, we're not actually able to put it in the words before we can talk. It, you know, like many things in the 20th century got compartmentalized and placed into the ivory towers of the academy. And we ended up thinking that, you know, theology is a specialty thing that only people with certain training can do. If I, if I convince us of nothing else, I want us to realize that that is a falsehood and a dangerous one. Um, you are all theologians. It's just my job to help you understand that. And that's what we hope to do together. All right. Um, and for those who are helping here, you, uh, let's see, I, I won't be able to see the chat while I'm screen sharing. So if someone needs to cut me off because you can't hear me or something, um, just, be, you know, just let me know. So theology was known throughout the ages, um, certainly from the Reformation and, 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 and in the Enlightenment, really through the mid 1800s, as the queen of the sciences. So, what does that mean? That means whenever people were doing scientific investigations in the ages of discovery, the science, whether it was, you know, you know, chemistry, or 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 geology, or medicine, or astronomy, always as as a partner was the theological quest. So when Isaac Newton is writing his treatise on gravity, he's also writing, what does this tell me about the nature of the universe? What does this tell me about the nature of God? And this really is an expected piece, even of hard science in, in the West until the, the late 1800s. Um, and, and a lot of factors come into that. Primarily, we had begun to have two things happen. Number one, especially in the United States, we had a more pluralistic society developing. Not everyone had the exact same understanding of, of, of religion or of what God is and what God is not. But the other thing is we started to have significant and serious biblical criticism using the same tools that we would use to, to investigate and criticize any other ancient text. And what this began to do is made us realize that the Bible, which was the primary sole source of, of received religious wisdom, was a book of books, that it had its oddities and peculiarities and a lot of it is really hard to make any sense out of because it is written by human beings with all of their stuff and their agendas and so theology itself over time even in christian circles especially liberal christian circles and by that i mean you know episcopal american baptist presbyterian unitarian universalist quaker etc they begin to see theology as not simply about what the study, what about being the study of God. Instead, they understand it as a more complete investigation about everything that is important to humanity, to us as individuals. And what they end up saying to and then writing about is they sort of change the investigation to instead of always being about the study of God, which is the etymology of the word theology, 
It is instead, it's the search for what we find to be of ultimate concern. What is it that we think is the most truthful thing upon which we can base a life? What can we say with any certainty about the nature and origin of the universe, about the nature and origin of divinity? All of these things become central to theology, and we begin to move away from just, just God talk, right? We begin to move towards an understanding that since human beings, and now I'm going to be referring to the document shared, that since human beings write these things and celebrate these things, we need to understand what human beings are. So anthropology, what is our doctrine of human nature? Do we believe that human beings are inherently good or inherently not so good, right? Is there a human nature? Are we free to act in the world or are we fated? Um, are human beings a special part of the creation? Other aspects of theology is the cosmology. These are the classic questions, right? What's the nature of ultimate reality? What's the origin of the universe? Is there a God? And if so, where does God live? What does God do? These are those cosmological questions. The epistemological question is central to theology because if we're gonna make a claim that something is true, that it's worth basing our lives and our communities on, well, on what do we base that truth? Is it just the brightest idea we could find? Is that good enough, right? So how do we claim to know what we believe to be true, right? Uh, what are our sources of authority? And in contemporary times, and this is where I find the exciting part of epistemology, what is the role of music and poetry and art, physical activity of relationship? to what we know and what we can claim to be true. There are lots of other big words that are the components of a theology. Um, one of them, ecclesiology, which is how our congregations organized. What is the congregation? Is the church the gathered community? Or like in Calvinist religion, um, is it just the elect? Um, or is it just the people who are engaged? What's the church? What's the congregation? Um, how does religious and human history inform our quest? And here in Unitarian Universalist circles, the one aspect of theology that we seem to be most comfortable with, um, and I would suggest because of that, we should probably spend less time on it um, because it's kind of in our wheelhouse, is ethics. If we claim all these things to be true, then how are we supposed to act in the world? How are we supposed to be with one another? What kind of covenants should we create? What kind of public policy should we do, right? That's the ethical question. There's lots of other components of theology, um, and uh, but those are sort of the basic building blocks. And so when you understand theology as science, you start to realize any deep pro question in some way is a theological question. If you're trying to figure out why is this the way it is, why, you know, why do people in Texas have to freeze because of, you know, bad public policy, you know, at some point you push deep enough, there's a theological claim under there that created that reality, you know, whatever the question is. So um, this probably sounds, I can hear some of you thinking, oh yeah, of course he thinks everything's theology because he's a theologian and a minister. And maybe that's true. Um, so, so some of the things I want to speak to about theology that you should, that I, that I want to share with you as well. Um, you know, it's often thought that theology is just, you know, a deep investigation, you know, of a particular religious text, but that, that's a piece of it. But it's also, how do we approach the text? What do we do with it once we reach a conclusion? And are we just in using those conclusions to set the rules everybody has to live by? You know, these are all theological questions. Um, so a lot of people will note that 
you know, reading, you know, the 20th century theology, especially not so much Dolores Williams, but, but, but some other um, in the, especially in the mid 20th century, though, there certainly is some of it in, in Williams text. You'll notice there's a lot of similarities between philosophy and theology. And so philosophy, you know, focuses on uncovering wisdom or the wise thing, um, often in hopes of living a good life. Theology looks for the ultimate grounding on which the world moves and from which we can thrive with integrity and authenticity. They both aim at discovering truth. Um, I find theology a lot easier to read, um, but you know, it is just like reading any discipline, you know, there are skills involved and theology has changed. You read theology from the 19th century, early 20th century, it is obtuse, as obtuse and difficult to make your way through as anything that you would ever hope to be asked to read. It just is. But something happens in theology in the 20th century. And a lot of it has to do with some of the movements that come after the Second World War. After the Second World War, the colonial states of the world begin to get restless and demand their independence. The same thing begins to happen in the United States where those who had been marginalized begin to organize and press for their freedom. And however incomplete those freedom movements were, what they did create was a new way of expressing truth that found its way into the academy over time. And we're gonna come back to that. Um, I'm gonna share some, some of uh, James Cone's work. work. Uh, so much so that by, the, by 1967, I believe it was, James Cone becomes the first African-American who is a full professor in a United States sem seminary. He becomes an endowed chair at Union Theological Seminary, which is over in New York, part of the Columbia University panoply of institutions. And of course it's 1967. So when he releases his book, Black Theology, Black Power, on the heels of the uprisings and after the assassination of Martin Luther King, it just creates all kinds of consternation among the traditional theologians. And, and, and we'll get to some of that. So, Let's take a step back for a second. I'm gonna talk more about theology generally. We'll take a break and then we'll start after the short break with some of the James Cone material and then start to place uh, Dolores Williams in the context of that because Dolores Williams as a woman is responding directly to James Cone who's just responding directly to the white theology that he was told he was supposed to be teaching. But we'll come to that. All right. Let me, let me stop for a second to catch my own breath. Are you with me? And, or at least close enough. You've got a handle. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, good, good. Um, <clears throat> so where we are next is I'm gonna share this with you. And again, all this material will be sent to you. So um, one of the things that I think is important to remember about theology and, and, and it begins to happen in the 1960s as well. We begin to realize the way theology had been done made a whole lot of assumptions that weren't really good at advancing the truth. And we began to realize that there are lots of valid theological viewpoints. So these are some things, I call these the genotypes of theology. 
And as I say, whenever we do our own theology, we're always engaging in two or more of these. So there's systematic theology. If you want to read systematic theology, read like Thomas Aquinas. There's old long theses, which are almost like mathematical proofs, one built upon another. Paul Tillich, the 20th century liberal Lutheran, writes a systematic theology. It doesn't look a lot like Aquinas because he was a liberal, but those are systematic theologies. There's exegetical theology, and that's the kind of theology which is significantly grounded in a particular sacred text. Exegesis means how do you pull meaning out of the text. There's what I like to call evocative or generative theology. That's almost just like jazz. You know, you know, we've we've got something appears to us and all of a sudden we have an insight. And if we're lucky, we we write about it or we create something in response to it to share it with other people. There's prophetic theology. We're aware of that. That you would recognize that from Reverend William Barber has a prophetic theology. He takes an existing tradition and reminds people that it's actually telling us to do something intense and if not radical, right? That the tradition itself, if we're supposed to be loyal to it, is commanding that we act in certain ways. It's a very he heavily ethical and moral the uh, way of doing theology. Um, some of the other ones, you know, liturgical theology, that's a belief that if you do the worship service in certain ways, that you can help people have a particular kind of religious experience. Um, liberation theology, this comes primarily out of South, Amer South and Central America and, and the Hispanics cultures that were responding to them shrugging off their colonial masters from the previous several hundred years. And they were masterful at using Catholicism to say what you've been doing to us is a crime and here's why and here's why this is the real meaning of your religion so start living it and of course in in the 60s we have the beginning of what's known as identity caucusing what does that mean that means folks who share an identity whether they're whether they're you know men or women or trans or um or latinx or or whatever your identity is black or 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 whatever it is they're writing a theology from a very particular identity right um and then there's types of theologies that's narrative theology as opposed to systematic theology narrative theology tells its its truths in a story it wraps it in something that has a beginning middle and an end that that we can recognize and we might be able to make a film out of or something right it, it it's it's that and really some of the great black theologians, Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King, others, they, they write in a narrative way, a way that you can understand the development. And then, and then so that's really all I need to share from that particular piece. What, what, so what happens, and this probably, it should not surprise you, but when folks like Martin Luther King and others begin to write their identity narrative, prophetic theology, beginning in the in the 1950s well they're criticized by the academy that well this isn't theology it isn't like calvin or aquinas you know you're just telling a story you're just you know this is you know this is social justice but they didn't see social justice as theology you know um and and, and king was not taken seriously as a theologian he was taken seriously as an activist because we didn't understand that theology could be many different things. And in fact, I've said this before, uh, I think I just said it last week in the Widening the Circle class, if average people can't understand it, I don't think it has much use. So if, if you need to go to the academy and be in an ivory tower and have studied Aquinas and, and all the ancient languages to understand a text, well, you may have done something remarkable, but I don't know what use it has for the world and how we organize our lives and how we organize our societies, right? So really in many ways, the liberationists, the queer, the feminist theologies, the black theologies, they have transformed us and in, into in, in being able to embrace theology as something we all do. We owe them all a debt because the so-called experts who were guarding the ancient pavilions of white supremacy and, and academia, you know, um, needed to be hauled down 
from those lofty heights because they weren't really doing anything that resembled truth. All right, so there was another sermon. Oh, sorry about that. It happens, occupational hazard. Um, so I'm gonna share a, a couple of quotes. Um, one of them is from James Luther Adams. He's a Christian Unitarian from the middle 20th century. And I will just simply put this in the chat. So Adams declares that theology is faith seeking understanding, understanding of self, understanding of reality. The task of theology is to define reality, but also to define the capacity in the human being, understanding the reality which we confront and of which we are. Theology begins with the recognition of some kind of fact. It begins with a declaration that something is true or something's wrong or something needs our attention or something needs to be celebrated. So that, that's one of our own in this milieu of the 20th century, trying to pry open the doors of, of, of theological expression for average people, because if it, if it can't be understood by average people, it, it's, it's useless. And I'm not talking about, you know, being a brain surgeon or someone who can fix computers, right? I, I mean, basic truths about how we should live. Yeah. You got me worked up. I don't know what you guys are doing to me tonight. Um, so I think, I think we're going to take a deep break, break there, just a brief break uh, there. Um, I, let's see. So Cohn, yeah, Cohn was, that's true, uh, Wendy, Cohn was uh, responding to Malcolm X, and deliberately so. Um, Sue has shared that she's come to feel she's more of a humanist because she sees God and goddess and people, particularly in how they respond to adversity. Um, theology, the study of religious belief. Um, yeah, how are we connected, Judy says. Is there an ultimate power, the nature of humans being? Is there even a God? I always like to say, you know, what, what God is or what God is not, um, or, yeah. So there's lots of good stuff you guys shared. All right, let's um, take a break here. And, um, and Dion shared, theology is the continued attempt of the community to define in every generation its reason for being in the world. And I'm actually gonna quote from a black theology of liberation just on the other side of the break. Um, so I encourage you to, Take a deep breath. Imagine any questions you have uh, about what I've presented so far. And then we're going to come back. And I'm going to share a little brief video clip, talk a little bit about where um, Dolores Williams was taking off and, and what she wanted to do um, to teach us something that we needed to be taught. All right. Just, uh, just two minutes. All right. Thank you. Mm. Okay. All right. And we're back. And we're back. Um, all right, everybody. So let me kind of get back to where we want to situate Dolores Williams and womanist theology in this particular history. So, of course, womanist theology <clears throat> is responding to Black theology, and Black theology emerges because of the legacy of white supremacy, especially in the founding of the United States, and so, obviously, part of situating this text includes a clear understanding of the history of white supremacy. Now, I'm not going to give you all that tonight. I'm going to share a document with that. It's about a nine-page document that I used for, for another class. But it's important to remember that you know, there was slavery in the ancient world. It was different in many different places. 
Usually it was a matter of conquest of a different tribe or a different nation. Most places in the ancient world, children of slaves were not necessarily slaves in perpetuity. Usually in the ancient world, and even through medieval times, people of a certain group weren't always necessarily the ones to be enslaved. It really isn't until the 15th century and the Portuguese slave trade begins after the age of discovery and, and Europeans can more easily go to Africa and all around the world that they realize there's money to be made. And so they begin the slave trade in earnest and the, the Portuguese begin it, the, the, the Dutch and the Spanish kind of perfect it and um, it spreads all over the world. There were many different types of folks who were enslaved in the early days, but in the United States, somewhere in, in the late uh, 1600s, especially after Bacon's rebellion where black slaves, white indentured servants, and even just poor whites banded together to overthrow the Virginia aristocracy, that they began to invent the notion that somehow there should be some perpetual punishment for being black. That if you are black, you are to be enslaved in this country. And they, that's the rise of the first, what we would consider police force and the, and the very first police forces in this country were organized to terrorize black people and to bring black people back into slavery if they had escaped or to bring it into slavery if for somehow they were considered free. And of course, we know a lot of this history of our own country, our nation's founding, our, our founding fathers, they were fathers who wrote the documents, um, could not summon the courage to begin our nation without slavery. <clears throat> Even deem African-Americans three-fifths of a human being. And then in 1793, with the invention of the cotton gin, we have the world's first ever boom crop in cotton. And the United States, because it has slavery, England is about ready to eradicate slavery. Um, at this time in the late 1790s. In the United States, the economic drive, the greed to continue to make as much money as possible because you're getting your labor for free, keeps slavery from being abolished through legislative means. Over the early 1800s, many, many churches, many denominations begin to split. Methodists, for one, the Methodists were founded as an anti-slavery church. And then Southern Methodism in 1844 splits off only because they want to continue to tell their parishioners that God says it's okay to be a slaver. Same thing happens to the Baptists in 1846. And many of the other denominations in this nation either split or look the other way when it comes to the issue of slavery. And then, of course, we know the history of the Civil War and how Reconstruction was deliberately, deliberately in a smoky backroom deal to make Rutherford Hayes in 1876, how, how Reconstruction is deliberately killed. All federal troops were moved out of the South. Southern constitutions allowed to be rewritten, denying humanity and dignity and legal rights to blacks to the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment of the constitution. We have the next hundred years with its convict leasing where if you were, could be picked up for, for jaywalking or, or vagrancy because you didn't have any money because you didn't have a job and sold to a business that the sheriff and the county made money on your labor, re-enslavement. That's why that film, Slavery by Another Name, which was the title of the first class we had in this series. All this is the fabric of American life that leads us towards the Second World War, people coming home from brave soldiers, 
having fault for the good cause and being treated again inhumanly. And then the rise, the slow rise of the civil rights movement, which really kind of begins in, in, the, in the late 1940s. And because uh, some of the black churches in, in the United States had really encouraged a learned ministry. This was true for Dr. King. This was true in AME. This was true in, in, in some of the Baptist uh, expressions. And so they learn the history. They learn how to organize and they create the civil rights movement. And then with the victories that come about in the early 60s, the, the Voting Rights Acts, the Civil Rights Acts, there is a feeling that freedom is much closer. And when they're looking around the world, watching the former colonial states throw off their masters, the demand becomes louder as it should have. And King himself realized that freedom wasn't just about being able to sit on the bus. It was about actually maybe owning the bus company. It was about having full citizenship. And this is why you know, towards the end of his life, you know, he was fighting for the poor people's campaign because he realized that freedom had to be intersectional and multifaceted. That's why he starts speaking out against the Vietnam War. That's why he teams up with Cesar Chavez and, and the Mexican farm workers uh, movement. That's why, you know, he, he looks for economic freedom as well. So after, so after King is assassinated, a lot of a lot of folks begin to think in the black community, at least according to scholars that I've read and, and the documentary that I'm gonna share uh, some of this from, uh, many of you have seen this, the black church, the PBS documentary, they begin to question if the black church actually can continue to lead them all the way to the promised land. And out of this comes this voice of James Cone. So I'm just gonna let him shine here a little bit for you and speak. Oops, let me do that again because I forgot to optimize for video clip, which if you don't do that, y'all can't hear it very well. All right, and here we go. And one more time, here we go. sin and sorrow on an island in life dark sea when I saw after the stunning legislative victories of the civil rights movement black churches found themselves at a crossroad they could retreat from the front lines or they could try to remain relevant by incorporating this flood of black nationalism into their theology. But churches remain the center of inspiration and uplift in an increasingly volatile world. Would create a new theology that fused the cultural, the political, and the spiritual, radically redefining the role of black Christianity in a revolutionary new era. White theology basically is a theology which has defined the Christian faith in such a way that it has no relationship to black people. In 1969, James Cone, a professor at Union Theological Seminary, published Black Theology and Black Power. King's witness is making its way into seminaries. But James Cone, who's trying to figure out how to translate King's moral call to the nation and express it in a way that will speak to the rage of the moment. Black theology is basically a new way 
of looking at the relationship between black religion and black political struggle and an embrace of the tenets of black is beautiful in a comfort with African inflected practices. God is on the side of the oppressed. And since the oppressed are the ones who need to be liberated, he must be identified with their condition. Cohn argued that God was so intimately connected with struggle and against oppression that God, in effect, had been black all along. He said that God's story is the black story and the black story is God's story. Mm -hmm. And that, he said, is the Christian story. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I was ready to leave Christianity because if I couldn't be black and Christian, then I wasn't gonna give up being black. What I discovered when I discovered Dr. Cohn's work was my own black faith. Cohn's theology would soon move from the confines of the seminary into popular culture. What is it? I call it Black Jesus. Black Jesus. Now this is what the brothers need. And would inspire a new generation, both of black clergy and feminist scholars, to bring black liberation theology to the people. The culture says you're the wrong race. The price says I made your race, and I ain't made no mistakes. The culture says your skin is black. The price says, and so was mine. All right, so um, I think I gave you enough of a taste of that part of that show. That at the end was uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright from Trinity in Chicago, um, whose, whose congregation, they said that we're uh, unashamedly Christian and unabashedly black. Um, and and uh, he's, I actually was blessed to have him treat me to lunch one day. One of my, uh, my, my clinical pastoral education colleagues uh, was a member of that church when I was in Chicago in seminary. And he showed up with fried chicken from some soul food place around the corner. And I need to say no more. Um, so this comes out and, and really begins to, and this, this is not a class in the black church. So of course the black church is involved in this. So, you know, um, I need to share some of this with you. And this really changes the black church. It really, it, it becomes a fork in their development in this time of history. And they have to decide if they're going to follow these strong voices or if they're going to have a different kind of theology. And, and we can talk about that later. But this is a pivotal moment, 1969 through 1972, when all this is occurring. Um, I want to share something else that, that, that Cohn teaches. And, and uh, so and interestingly, now this is not the first time that a major black religious leader has said that God must be black. Famously, uh, William McNeil Turner, an AMA, AME leader in 1894, it was just towards the end of his life. And many people think he finally felt liberated to just say what he really, really wanted to say all along. But he was a great institution builder. Um, but he, he says famously, he says, God must be black. And, and he says, anyone who thinks that their God does not look like them is worshiping the wrong God. And then we have James Cone come up with this statement. And again, I'll, I, I like to put it in here for those who like to read along. It's in the chat. He writes, and this is in the preface to the 1986 edition of A Black Theology of Liberation. He writes, theology is not universal language about God. Rather, it is human speech informed by historical and theological traditions written for particular times and places. Theology is contextual language that is defined by the human situation that gives birth to it. No one can write theology for all times, all places, all persons. Therefore, when one reads a theological text, it is important to note the year of its publication, the audience for whom it was written, and the issues the author felt compelled to address. Theology is only 
rational discourse about is not only sorry I misquoted that is not only rational discourse about ultimate reality. It is also a prophetic word about the righteousness of God that must be spoken and clear in clear, strong and uncompromising language. Must be spoken in clear, strong and uncompromising language. And this goes back to what I was speaking to before that theology is particular. Our, our, our biology, our experience, uh, our biography, I should say, is what composes our theology. What we live through, who formed us, where we grew up, our, our loves, our communities, our trials and tribulations, our, what oppresses us. These are what compose what we believe in our deepest soul. And, and, and James Cone and, and the other theologians of this era just finally gave chase to the lie that somehow you could have a common theology that speaks about what God is and God is not for all people and for all time. That is simply not possible. When I think of it, when I think of this, I try to imagine Hinduism. Hinduism I find to be helpful in, in this particular way. Hinduism speaks about tens of thousands of manifestations of deity. And whatever any of them are, whatever their cosmic reality may or may not be, the reason there are tens of thousands of manifestations of, of, of divinity is because we all have different ways of accessing the truth. We all will respond differently to how the divine appears and speaks and asks us to live. There's no, there's, it, it's, it's foolhardy and arrogant to suggest that just the one voice in the one way in the one style in the one book is going to be good for everyone. In the end, that is oppression, frankly, if not abuse. So in the midst of all this, we, we have students like the woman who was on the on the end of the video, and then and then Dolores Williams, who becomes a student of James Cone's, and becomes a really good student, and like like a, like a really good student that you hope you have, um, really pesky, and keeps saying you keep saying men men men, and at first he thinks it's just the feminist push to degenderize language, which of course was a piece of it. But she was wondering why in his powerful theologies, he was not elevating the experience of, of women. He wanted to know where is the black wo woman in your theology? You're calling this black, this is black male theology, she says to him over and over in writing and in person. And so she ends up Come Reverend up. Scott, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat yourself? I lost you for a moment. So you said, who is saying this? Is someone critiquing James Cone, saying that he's only talking about a male? The I, Amazon is delayed in getting me my book. So, but um, is it is it a delay? No, no. It's Dolores Williams. It's Dolores she Williams. She is saying this about James Cone. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. She's not the only one. But she's the one who writes the seminal text. And, and so she is saying, so I'm just going to read something from, and, and please read the preface and, and, and introduction. This will really get you even better situated for this text. She writes like, she writes, after my participation in the civil rights movement of the 60s, after the births of my four children, after my college training, my late seminary education, my PhD studies, after the sudden death of my husband and my resulting single parent status, I find myself testifying. Faith, hard won, has taught me how to value the gains, losses, standoffs, and victories in my life. And many times the painful moments would not have been healed were it not for the road, I traveled to faith. Again, the particularity of the theological 
understanding. Learning to trust the righteousness of the divine in spite of trouble and injustice. Learning to trust women of many colors, regardless of sexism, racism, classism, and homophobia. Learning to believe in the sanctuary power of family defined in many ways in addition to the nuclear family. Discovering love in a variety of forms that heal, but also believing serious political action is absolutely necessary. And faith has also taught me to see the miraculous in ordinary black women resisting and rising above the evil forces in society where forces work to destroy and subvert the creative power and energy. My mother and grandmother taught me that God gave all black women. And later on, she will go on to more pointedly criticize Cohn and, and he, I haven't found him mentioning her by name, but, but definitely in the, in the uh, preface to the 1986 edition of uh, a black theology of liberation, he talks about all the ways, things he was blind to. He's very open that, you know, he missed a lot of marks. He said he missed queer theology. He missed feminist theology. He missed womanist theology. He missed liberationist theology. He's very, he's very humble of admitting that, you know, and, and what a great, what, what, what a great teaching you know, that, that the lion, the, the, the most important black theologian, you know, 17 years after his famous, most famous publication is like, you know, I didn't get it all right. And I'm here to set the record straight and to lift up those who have taught me, you know, and you may, we all have such humility and courage, right? Um, he also in, in introduction to the, the, the cross and the lynching tree. He reminds us that, well, let's not stay, let's stay with the Lewis Williams. We're at, we're at 22 past. So all of these texts have been gathered and listed in a resource we will make available to you. And let me just show you what they look like. Um, all right. So anything anyone want to add or ask me about as I'm sharing these? So these are just a handful of the resources that we think will help us get to a, a better place of understanding. Um, you know, some Do you of have any Howard Thurman's there? I can barely. The one yep. that, that I would like to suggest is the luminous darkness. And um, it's a commentary on what segregation does to the human soul. And he's just is such a beautiful writer. Yeah, if there's anything you think we should put on the resource list, just send it to us and we'll make sure it's on the list. Okay. Um, Thurman, uh, I don't have best here. The ones I know best of his are more devotionals and like prayer collections, but but so what I've included here is some identity theologies, just to let you know what's what on the side of the poor is liberationist theology from Gustavo Gutierrez. Um, uh, longing for running water sh sh should be on here if I haven't put it on here, right? That's by the Brazilian nun, Ivan Gabara. Ecofeminism is that intersection of ecological concern and feminist theology. Um, uh, Vine Deloria is an amazing read. He'll have you cracking up. He's a brilliant scholar. And the, just the way that he dismantles white supremacist culture, it, you just, you can't help but laugh, you know, unless for some reason you want it to continue, I guess. He has, his famous texts are God is Red, because he's Native American, um, and Custer Did Not Die for Your Sins. That book is a laugh a page or two, I'm telling you. Um, and so there's lots of stuff here that we're putting on here, including some films. Um, in addition to that, uh, where you have um, a glossary for some of the terms, uh, this is this sort of starts more about um, the, uh, this is more deeply the theological understandings. Um, and so, you know, some of the different isms that people talk about with theology. You'll notice when I, when I teach theology, I don't talk about this in a overview. These are what, what are known as like uh, spiritual worldviews. Um, and it's not that they're not important, but 
to me, they're, they're tangential for our class, but I just wanted to make them available to you. Um, and uh, with your materials. But let me just quote one more time from Dolores Williams to sort of get you eager to dig into this text. And this is from page one. There's a lot of, there's usually a lot of good stuff on page one on any really good book. So uh, this is on page one. Um, she talks about her development as a theologian, as a, as a, as an African American female Christian. And she had a great mentor who actually suggested that her anxiety that she wasn't finding what she was looking for um, was because she wasn't spending enough time with African American female sources. Um, and and she had, and this is when she discovers that she had that most of the black theology she had read was from a black male perspective. She she says that I had noticed that what the sources presented as black experience was really black male experience. So when I began reading available black female and black male sources with my female identity fixed firmly in my consciousness, she says. I made a startling discovery. I discovered that even though black liberation theologians used biblical paradigms supporting an androcentric, male-centric um, bias in their theological statements, the African-American community had used the Bible quite differently. And for over a hundred years, the community had appropriated the Bible in such a way that black women's experience figured just as eminently as black men's in the community's memory in the stories the church told, the stories the church people told each other. And as I read deeper into these sources from my female perspective, I began to see what it was, that it was possible to identify a powerful black female stance from which to do theology. So that's where we are headed. Um, I strongly suggest that any of you all of you, if you don't already have one, get yourself a good study Bible. These are available for free online. Um, I prefer having the big old clunky brick, uh, the lug around, so I can write all over it. Um, um, either the New Interpreter's Bible or the um, Oxford uh, Study Bible, the Harper Collins Study Bible. Um, it's important to have a study Bible because you will get a lot of things that help you if you don't happen to be, you know, uh, if biblical literacy isn't your hallmark. Um, and uh, dare I say it, that may be true for some Unitarian Universalists. Um, um, it's important for you to be able to figure it out in, in the same text. So there's notes at the bottom of the page, there's maps in the back, each chapter of a good study Bible will give you an outline of what the what that chapter of the Bible is about. We're gonna be spending most of our time in Genesis, um, a little bit of Galatians, a little bit of Luke. And the central story that, that Dolores Williams uses, you know, as the, the catalyst for this important work is the story of Hagar who is Sarah, Abraham's wife's slave. And the child that Hagar has, because to that point in the story, Sarah was unable to have children. And as was common in that culture, the slaves of the wife were able to help the husband produce an heir and we'll go through the whole story next week and i will make sure i include the bible passages for you in what i send to you it's it's genesis 16 it, uh, it returns to the story in genesis 21 um so 
without knowledge of that story, the rest of the book makes little sense. So we're going to spend the first part of the next class on that story. Then we're going to start digging into chapters one, two, and three. And there will be a little bit less of me doing all the talking, if you're lucky. Um, Sarah Scott, I have a question. On page 16 of her book, there is a reference, capital CF, DC8, you know, chapter 33 yeah. to 9. What is CF? Mm -hmm. I will have to get back to you on all that. It's C reference um, from chapter 3. It's, um, I'll have to look into that. I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head. I tried Googling it and I couldn't find it, so I figured maybe you would know. <laughs> Yeah, so that was page 16. So just send me a note to that and I will have that for the um, next week. Yeah, all right. So um, we are one minute past. Um, we may end up, this may be a class that goes more to 840 or 845. I, I'm just gonna say that out loud. So I don't feel so awful about keeping us long. Um, but there's a lot to cover, but we will slow down beginning next week. This, I, I really felt that um, without getting us to a place where we understand the milieu, where you understand what theological thinking is, which is basically any serious investigation of something that's important, um, I think it was gonna be harder to dig into this text. Um, any other observations, questions, or um, requests? No, I just ordered my free study Bible. Uh, it's easy to do. <laughs> Thank you. I have my grandfather's Bible, but I don't want to write on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Did you find the Bible on Amazon? Because I could only find it in hardcover. I'd rather not have a hardcover if I can avoid that. So this I, I got at a bookstore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Local one? <laughs> no, um, I, can't, I got it some several years ago. So I think it was probably Barnes and Noble. No, oh, okay. Okay, thanks. I'll search it out. Thanks. Where, so, did, where did you find that free Bible? I just Googled free study Bible. <laughs> oh, you got it for free? Yep. Online. It's right. It's not... Get took your address, have a privacy policy. So uh, we'll see. Okay. So, uh, I gotta go. Take so, care. This is great. Uh, right. Anyone yeah. needs to go because we're after 8:30. Fine. Uh, yeah, everybody. Closing. I recommend you use either the new new international version, the NRSV, which is the new revised standard version, or the new English translation. Um, there are reasons to use those primarily because. The scholarly conversation is based on, on those three primarily, probably a little bit more the NRSV and the NIV, but um, other versions of the Bible may have better poetry, maybe more familiar, but they've been shown since we've had the more serious investigation of, of the Bible since the late 1800s to not be nearly as accurate in their translations. Um, so that's why if you were asking me which ones, I, I recommend one of those three. Um, yeah, and so, <clears throat> all right, so I've got piles of books here, don't know what I'm going to do with them all, so, um, all right, anything else that folks want to ask me about, uh, no, all right, I'm going to ask uh, the team to stay on, Debbie and Dion to stay on. And I will look. I will look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Rev. Thank you. Uh, thank you.